Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Life in the Word. And today we're going to be studying Mark chapter 4. And I'm excited about launching into this chapter because I believe that it is going to spiritually provoke us uh, to have a greater intention in the way that we listen uh, to God's Word, that we take heed to God's Word. But before we get started into this chapter, let's just pray right now. Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to come. And we acknowledge that without the aid of the Holy Spirit, we are blind and we are deaf. But Holy Spirit, would you open up the eyes of our understanding and that you would give us the ability uh, to see and to savor Christ Jesus. And as you reveal him through uh, the word of God, we ask that we would grow in our understanding with greater intimacy and greater uh, knowledge and comprehension and understanding of who he is and what he has spoken to us. Let your word come alive to us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, before we get into the verses themselves, I want to just give an example of something that I heard from a former president of the University of Southern California. And he wrote in a book, and I believe that book was called Contrarian Leadership. And he talked about that everyone has a perception that they are good drivers that they have a good sense of humor, and that they're good listeners. Well, today we're going to take a hearing test because I think all of us can have a wrong perspective uh, in all three of those categories. We may not be as good a driver as we think we are. We may not think that our sense of humor is as good as it should be, specifically if the joke is on us, uh, but also primarily we must have an occasional hearing test that God gives us to check ourselves to see if we are effective and responsive listeners, uh, not only to those that we're in a relationship with, but ultimately with the God who desires to speak and to have fellowship and intimacy with us. Now, Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to give you just a little bit of an overview. Jesus uh, is going to talk to a large crowd of people, and he is going to use a, a boat out on the shoreline as his platform to declare uh, secrets of the kingdom of God to those that are gathered to listen to him. But instead of talking to them plainly, Instead of talking to them uh, in a way in which everybody would understand what he is saying, he speaks to them in parables. And we're going to right away share with you why I believe that Jesus began to use parables to speak to them. Number one, he understood his audience, and a part of it was that by storytelling, he could illustrate uh, truths of the kingdom of God to them. Things that they may have a hard time comprehending, it could be easier for them to understand. But also, there is the exact opposite of that intention for the use of parables. As we can see, as we have studied the Gospel of Mark, that the Pharisees are trying to uh, understand who this country rabbi is. Where does he get his authority from? Where do you get off saying the things that you've been saying? Where do you get off in doing the things that you're doing? And we have talked about how he's, he has exhibited authority over sickness, over disease, over the realms of darkness, and that he is starting to make claims about himself uh, or demonstrate the authority and power that he does possesses that permits him to do things that a man should not be able to do. 
And so he said, the Son of Man, so that you would know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say to this man, take up your bed and to walk. He also confronts the Pharisees that are questioning uh, why he is permitting his disciples to do things that looks on the surface as if they're violating the Sabbath principle and violating the Sabbath. And Jesus said, I want you to know, I created the Sabbath, and the Sabbath's purpose uh, was not that uh, man was created for the day, but the day was created for man, to have rest and to have pleasure and to experience enjoyment in a day that God would create for them so they could renew, they could be restored, they could reboot. And so there is a growing controversy and an opposition and a resistance against what Jesus is saying. And so Jesus begins to talk in parables knowing that he wants some responsive, attentive listeners to be able to understand what he is saying and he can teach them the secrets of the kingdom, the way the kingdom works, the way the kingdom operates, what God is doing in this moment and hour in the kingdom, but to those who have a hard heart, those that, that are not perceptive hearers, those that are not attentive listeners, they'll hear it but will not understand what he is saying. And so Jesus speaks to them in parables. Now, he begins with a very cornerstone parable, which he said that if you can understand this parable, you can understand all parables. So it really is an interpretive key that helps us understand all the parables that Jesus teaches. But he talks about a sower that goes, that sows seed in the framework of various fields and the result is based upon where the soil is, what type of soil it is, how, how um, uh, you know, broken up or tilled or developed the soil is to receive seed, there is a, a fruitfulness that occurs or a lack of fruitfulness and a response of the seed to the soil. And then I want us to look at verse 10, and we'll talk about the, the parable in just a few minutes, but I want to kind of walk through this entire chapter. So then in verse 10, when he was alone after this teaching time with the multitude, they asked Jesus, they said, why are you talking to us in stories? Why aren't you just openly, plainly instructing everyone? And Jesus said, because... Not everyone is going to be given the secret of the kingdom of God. What, what God is doing in this moment. There is some mystery that surrounds this moment. And not everyone is going to be granted the opportunity by God to understand what, why God is unfolding his kingdom purpose the way that he is doing it. And the reason why is because of past neglect of what had been prophesied, what had been spoken, what had been given to the people of God, Israel, and their leadership. And so Jesus quotes Isaiah, and this is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. He said that indeed they may see but not perceive. They may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. This was a moment where there was going to be a, a presentation to the kingdom to those that others had, had deemed them unqualified to be partakers of the kingdom. And there were those that assumed they were the rightful heirs of the kingdom and that because of their supposed knowledge and their, their uh, mastery of what they thought God had said in the past, they had assumed that the kingdom of God was going to be given to them. 
their knowledge had puffed them up and there was an arrogance, there was a blindness, there was a spiritual pride that caused them, instead of being spiritually perceptive and attuned to what God was di- doing, what they had done with what they had heard in the past, in their twisting of it, in their man-centering of it, in their perversion of it, to where they had, they had created a theological construct of who God was and, and what he was going to do had actually caused them to become blind, spiritually blind, spiritually tone deaf. And, and they were not perceptive. And so in this moment where the kingdom of God and the mystery of how it was going to unfold was going to blind, literally, no, no pun intended, blindside uh, the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They could not comprehend it. Even though Emmanuel, God among us, God manifested in the flesh, walking on the earth, they could not see him. They could not understand what he was saying. They were spiritually blind and deaf. But God said, or Jesus said, he said the purpose of the parables is so that when they hear it, they're not going to understand it because they have, dis- they have, they have qualified themselves in their own self-righteousness and they think that they are going to be the ones who possess the kingdom. But God says, no, the ki- kingdom is going to be given to others that they have disqualified and minimized and excluded from the benefits and the blessings of the kingdom of God. And he said, so I'm going to unpack the kingdom and it's going to be in ways in which only those that are responsive listeners, those that are attentive hearers, are going to be able to perceive what I am doing in the unfolding purpose and plan of God. And he said, really, the the point of of the parables is to open up the eyes of those that they think have been disqualified but continue to blind those that are walking in spiritual arrogance. Now, I want us to go over to verse 24 and Jesus uh, interprets the parable in verse 13 of the soil types and we'll get back to it in in a few minutes. But then he tells another parable in verse 21 about the lamp being under a basket and then it being put on a lampstand. Then he talks about the parable in verse 26 of the seed growing. And in verse 30, he talks about the kingdom of God being like a grain of mustard seed. All of these are connected together with the cornerstone parable of the the sower, the seed, and the soils. But really, I want, to, I want to look at the very heart of what Jesus is trying to communicate. He is saying to them that if you don't want to end up like the religious leaders of, of Jesus' day, if you don't want to end up allowing truth to blind you and deafen you, it's very important to those of you that are being given this opportunity to see what God is doing, that you also cultivate a hearing heart, that you cultivate a seeing eye, and you cultivate hearing ears. This chapter, Mark chapter 4, primarily is all about hearing and listening. Twelve times in this chapter, Jesus talks about hearing and listening, listening and hearing. And he gives several times an exhortation of a phrase that he uses quite often in the gospel. Whoever has ears to hear or hearing ears, they are permitted to hear. It means that not everybody's ears are listening ears. They're not hearing ears. They, they, they are not understanding what is being spoken. They're not perceiving what they're seeing. But he said, whoever has cultivated a hearing heart 
and has inclined their ear to hear, and they are attentive listeners, and they are, are, are uh, aggressive hearers, and they want to understand, they want to perceive, they want to know, they want to comprehend what God is saying, then more will be given to them. And so the heart of the truth of this, these parables and what they illustrate and, and the, the instruction of the Lord to his disciples is to say, God is allowing you the opportunity to understand the mystery of his will in this moment and how it's unfolding in a very secretive way, but you are given the opportunity to see it and perceive it. So he says, at this moment, this is verse 24, pay attention to what you hear. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. Now, we know that uh, teachers and coaches and parents have, have all told us as we were growing up in children, you're going to get out of this class or you're going to get out of uh, this activity what you put into it. And, and if I could just summarize it in that way, that is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He is saying that you have a, an opportunity that's been given to you by God. Make the most of this opportunity. And if you really incline your heart to understand, if you are not just a casual hearer, but you are a true seeker of truth and you are wanting to lay hold and pursue truth and you're in passionate pursuit of the heart of God and to understand what God is doing in your day. He said, more will be given to you. But the exact opposite is also true or the flip side of the coin is also true. If you are negligent, if you are passive, if you... If you are just a casual or an occasional listener, then even what you do have will be taken away from you. And this is what was going to happen to the religious establishment of Jesus' day, who had taken the commandments of God and made them a void and none of, uh, of no effect, where there wasn't a, a hearing and then an obedience uh, that they would be quick to hear and swift to obey. No, they had devised a religious system where they could neglect the commands of God, where they could reinterpret the commands of God, where they could harden their hearts to the commandment of God. And he said, all that they possess is diminishing and will be taken away from them and they will be left in a state of spiritual blindness and deafness and hardness of heart. And he said, but there is a warning to you, my disciples, that you can ultimately end up like them if you do not guard your heart and watch your heart and incline it to be a listening uh, and a hearing heart. And so Jesus talks about the danger of the state of our heart in this cornerstone parable. And he says, he is the sower. And the seed is the word. But we know that in this parable, he talks about how that Satan has an intention to try to keep us from truth. And he said some seed fell along the, the, the well-beaten path. And, and, and again, this is a warning about passivity and a warning about familiarity and the everydayness of life. Of how we can again get this compacted soil by, by everyday things that we do. And understand that if we, if we are pacified and, and in the everydayness of our life, we're not aggressive hearers and we're not trying to stay awake and alert to what God is saying. But we let the mundane and the ordinary and the common strip away the sacred. Satan is always there to try to take away from us that which God is trying to speak to us. He talks about the soil that, that is shallow and that there is, a, it, it, there is a, a, a rockiness there and it has a, a, a shallow depth and there is a hardness there. 
and the things that God would want to convict us of that shows hard places of our heart. Areas that we, we have not allowed God to deal with, to plow up and to remove those hard places out of our life. If, if, if we do not allow the, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit to cause us to see the issues of our heart that still remains, he said there will be no ability for the word to work in you and to develop a root system within you that is allowed to, to transform the soil. Because it, it literally the root systems of plants, once they are rooted and established, are able to actually change the very soil in which those root systems go down into. And so he says, don't allow your heart to be passive. Don't allow it to be hard. Then he talks about the deceitfulness of, 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 of worry and how that fear and anxiety can come in and how that uh, when fear is at work in our life, that it, that it chokes out the, the ability of the Word of God to again be fruitful in our life. And I was listening to a guy several weeks ago. He said, when we do not obey God's commands to not worry and not to have anxiety and not to be manipulated and controlled by fear, he said it is like a libel suit against the character of God. Of God. It's like we're defaming the character of God, the name of God, and the name of God being a representation of his nature and his character. And so, actually, when we're consumed with fear and worry and anxiety and we allow stress to come in to choke out uh, what God is saying to us, we are, we are making a charge against God and we're saying, God, you're, you're incapable of handling uh, your role and your responsibility of being God. Well, we've got to push back. We've got to, we've got to weed our heart. We've got to not allow the weed seeds to choke out uh, the living word, the living seed that God wants to plant in our heart. And the final one is the deceitfulness of riches, where there is a warning that we could deceive ourselves and, and that we could allow distractions to flourish and we could be chasing things that are trivial and temporal. And so the point is that we must be people that guard our hearts because the, the, the proverb writer Solomon said, for out of it flows the very issues of life, the very essence of how God wants to express his life is through our heart. And if, and if the enemy can do something to our heart to make it passive and inactive, if he can harden it, if he can choke it, if he can fill it with distractions, then God's a word of what he's speaking to us that propels us forward to walk in a confident identity and destiny. It, our, our destiny is disrupted. But thank God for those that have a hearing heart, those that have cultivated a heart to be a seeker that pursues truth at all costs, no matter what. Uh, we see the fruit and effect is that there is a hundredfold return upon the seed that is sown. And so we want to have a heart that is fruitful, that God can bring to pass everything that he has spoken concerning our life and concerning his purpose for his kingdom uh, uh, in and through our life as well. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about these other parables and, you know, because of this little Sunday school song, we, we come up with these little ditties and songs. And, and sometimes they can frame a mindset around what we perceive uh, about the interpretation of, of the parable. And Jesus said, no one takes and puts a, a candle under a basket, but no, uncovers it, puts it on a a lampstand, and so we sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But I want us to interpret this passage of Scripture uh, correctly. Again, just as Jesus is the sower of the seed, Jesus is the light that is put on the lampstand. And so, 
he was talking to his disciples about the unfolding mystery of the kingdom of God. And, and the kingdom is unfolding in a way in which most of the expectation of the Jewish people that had messianic hopes, it was unfolding in a way in which they were not discerning, a way in which they were not expecting. And so Jesus' arrival and what he's doing, what he's saying, and the demonstration of the power and the glory and the messaging, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But, but they're looking for a, a natural king. They're looking for a conqueror. Uh, they're looking for him to address the injustice of this oppressive tyranny of the Roman Empire. And it looks like Jesus is not doing any of those expectations, engaging in any of those messianic expectations. And so he's doing signs and wonders, but yet you're not addressing the political realities, Jesus. You are showing power over demonic things, but yet... Um, you're not claiming to be a natural king, even though you possess this power. And so in this parable, Jesus is saying to them that even though now ultimately the light is being covered, it is being hidden, it is not being demonstrated in a visible way. Some of these things are being done privately. And he's admonishing people, do not noise this miracle abroad. What is being done to you, to those that he's healing, don't tell anyone. Even though there is a concealing of the true identity of himself as the Son of God, the Messiah who was prophesied to come, he wants to assure his disciples that in the days to come, that which is now being hidden from the, the public, uh, hidden from the religious establishment, you know, all of the expectations of, of how people would feel that a public figure should perform. He's saying, ultimately, that which is now being seen but hidden and only revealed to a few, ultimately will be put upon the lampstand and this light will shine to everyone and it will become visible. And he said... If you, if you can see what is being shown to you now, if, if the glimpses that you're seeing, if you will look and you will listen and you will perceive what I'm trying to show you, even though it's in a secretive mystery, you will get to see more. And the more will lead to even more till ultimately you will be able to see it fully upon display. You will know uh, clearly what is being seen. And then he also, in these other two parables, he talks about the kingdom of God as a seed that is sown. And even though it is sown, it, it sprouts and, it's, and it begins to grow. And the seed is, is buried underneath the surface and no one even knows that it's been planted. But ultimately, as it begins to spring forth, it will become a mighty uh, a plant that reproduces a blade, and then a full ear, and then there's the full grain in the ear, and the grain becomes ripe, and then the sickle put it, is put in, and a harvest comes. Jesus is demonstrating that I am this light that right now is, is being hidden, but being revealed to a few, to some. Yeah, I am the seed that is being planted in the ground, and then it's going to begin to manifest and begin to grow, and my life is going to be reproduced in such a way that finally a mighty harvest will happen in the earth. And he says the same thing about the mustard seed, that even though it can be compared to one of the smallest of seeds, but once it grows up, it becomes a, a mighty tree that's larger than all the garden plants that puts out their large branches. And so he is telling them that even though I'm not behaving in the way that a public figure would, would behave, and even though I'm keeping things secret, you're being given an inside look into what God is doing. To you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now, in this chapter, he finishes up, or the story finishes up, this chapter finishes up on the very same day that he tells 
the crowd about the parable of the sower that sows the word. And then he tells them that you have been given insight into the unfolding mystery of the kingdom of God. He gets them across in this boat, tells them to cross over the sea. And in the middle of this journey, Jesus is asleep in the boat, resting, and a violent storm comes up. And they immediately are seized with fear. And they say, Jesus, you don't care anything about us. You don't love us. Because if you loved us, you would not allow us to drown. And we're all going to drown. And I want to see what Jesus said to them. And it said that he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? I think it's amazing to me how Jesus tells them, everything that you hear, you need to contend for what you're hearing. You need to press in to understand. You need to allow it to take root. You need to allow it to take deep root within inside you. You need to remove the hard places and you need to weed your field and you need to, to, to not allow the distractions and the cares of this life to, to, to choke out the word. You need to be aware of deception of the wealth of the world and how it would try to captivate your attention and deceive you. And then here he's told them, I'm giving you the opportunity. You, you see it. You hear it. You see the kingdom and its power unfolding before you. And I want you to know that I'm giving you the opportunity to hear, to understand, and to know it. And here they, they have this opportunity to exercise their faith in the word that they've heard. And then circumstantially, when the winds become contrary, they jettison everything that they've heard. And they simply react to their fears. To me it's stunning and amazing. But what's even more stunning is when I do the exact same thing that the disciples do. I jettison everything that he's spoken. All the promises of his word. And I do not root myself in the reality of that which God has spoken. And that which God has revealed. And the things that I am convinced of and know that they are true. And Jesus has to come to us and says, to say to us, you still don't have any faith. After all that I've shown you, all that I've done for you, all that I've spoken to you, do you still have no faith? I want us to be a people that say, Lord, I have faith. I think this is also another step where in this moment where they failed the spiritual test. They failed the hearing test. They also get another glimpse of the light as the basket comes off for a moment and his true identity is revealed. Because now he's not only showed a power over sickness and disease, and he showed power over the demonic. And he's going to do that again in the next chapter. But he's now shown a complete control and authority over nature. And they end this moment by saying, who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Now, just a quick application. Every time we, we study the word of God, every time we hear it on Sunday morning, every time we hear it in a Bible study, Every time we're doing our devotions, there is always a contest over what you're hearing. And I want us to be aware of the spiritual warfare. It's amazing how that much of what we do in our life, in the everydayness of it, is not contested. I want you to reflect back upon the Sundays when you tried to get your family to church. How that suddenly there was disruption between you and your wife or obedient kids that were obedient during the, the week so suddenly became, you know, contrary uh, to parents on the way to church. It's amazing 
how that we can see how much that Satan himself wants to keep you from hearing God's word because of the fruit and effect and the power that the word can have upon our lives. I want us to say, God, I want to treasure what you have shown me because I know that if I treasure it and I cultivate it and I allow the seed to reproduce in my life, more and more is going to be given to me. And Satan knows that, so he wants to do everything that he can stop do, he wants to do everything that he can possibly do to stop the reproductive power, the life-transforming nature and power of the Word of God from radically changing our lives. I want us to lay claim to our in, inheritance of the, the fullness of the kingdom of God and all uh, that it possesses and entails. Let us believe His Word and lean into it. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Bye.